Hello and welcome to Plymouth Church. We begin today with words of gratitude to Jim and Alyssa and Diane for that incredible music. Uh, the message couldn't be any simpler. Come. That's what God invites us to do. Come to this service of worship. I'm Dr. Deborah Lindsay and on behalf of all of us, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at Plymouth Church. Whether you are gay or straight, 
or a little bit of each, black or white or a little bit of each, male or female, young or old or a little bit of each, blue or red or a little bit of each. You're welcome here. We're glad you're here, especially on this Sunday. This is All Saints Sunday, a day when we celebrate and remember those who we love who have passed into the nearer presence of God. We'll be thinking and praying for them all throughout this service. This is also the first Sunday of the month, unless it's not Sunday when you're watching, and that's okay too. On this day, we celebrate communion, and so we invite you to have something to eat and something to drink. Doesn't matter what it is, uh, whatever it is and wherever you are, it is a sacred meal. And at the beginning of each service, we together light a candle. It is a reminder that we come together into the presence of God. We pray and sing and hear a message and join together in community. And we are very much a community, even though we may be worshiping from different places and spaces. So once again, we're glad you're here. Welcome to Plymouth Church, and let's join together in worship. Will you please join us in the call to worship as it appears on your screen? We remember teachers and, and storytellers who made God's stories come alive for us and we give thanks and we remember choir members, praise bands, organists, and all the musicians who sang and played your praises and we give thanks and we remember preachers and lay leaders who led our worship through the years, and we give thanks, and we remember parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, sisters, and brothers who sat with us on Sundays and lived out their faith all week long, and we give thanks, and we remember our church families, this one and others we have loved. We remember all those who have been a part of this faith family and we give thanks and we remember our ancestors in the faith whose courage enables us to be here today for our sisters and brothers in the faith whose names are remembered only by God. We give thanks. Amen.
Good morning, friends. It's time for our children's message. In today's story, we are going to hear about Esther. Esther was a Jewish woman living in Persia, and she was selected to be the king's wife. And later in the story, one of his um, highest generals wants to um, place an order that kills all the Jewish people in the land. Now, Esther's husband, the king, does not know that she is also Jewish. So she's been hiding it from him. And now that her people are in danger, she has a very important decision to make and she needs to show how brave she is. Let's read the story together. Extraordinary Esther. Extraordinary Esther, as you may have guessed, her people were oppressed. Her good king, she addressed, her people, then she blessed. Extraordinary Esther. Mordecai, her cousin, lots of trouble was in, worries by the dozen, could be hurt because in his land praying was a sin. Mordecai, her cousin. Hard-hearted Haman entered in the Freyman. All that he could say, man, was give me my own way, man. Lead the folks astray, man. Hard-hearted Haman. King Ahasuerus heard Esther's chorus. Please, king, stand for us. Armies march before us. Your word can restore us. King Ahasuerus. Purim's what we say for, Esther's special day for, Jews can dance and play for, their queen led the way for, her people to stay. Extraordinary Esther. All right, Extraordinary Esther indeed. She really had some tough decisions to make. She had been quietly and secretively living as a Jewish person, and the king did not know that. She was not really being herself. But when the other Jewish people were in danger, she decided it was time to risk everything and to really be herself and tell the king that he cannot kill all these innocent people. And he listened to her and she ended up being a true hero. I hope you enjoyed our story today and everybody have a blessed week. And we'll see you next time. Today we're going to talk about joy. It's the last day of our exploration of the book of Esther, although it is not the end of our sermon series for such a time as this. Esther, you might remember, was a Jewish woman married to a Persian king who was able to influence her husband not to go through with a plan to kill many, many Jews. It's a beloved story in Judaism. And Esther is a heroine of the Hebrew Bible, a woman of courage and conviction who jeopardized her own life for her people. As Leslie read in the children's sermon, extraordinary Esther, her king she addressed, her people she blessed. And her cousin Mordecai was right there beside her. A few weeks ago, I compared Esther's story to the Game of Thrones. It is a narrative that includes palace intrigue, secret alliances, sex, humor, and violence. A lot of violence. And we shouldn't just skim over that. That said, in the scripture text for today, we have arrived at the moment of celebration. The Jewish people are saved and a new festival is born. So hear now these, book, these words from the book of Esther. Mordecai recorded these things in a book and sent it to the Jews in the kingdom of Xerxes, both near and far, telling them that they should keep the 14th and 15th days of Adar. For on these days, the Jews got relief from their enemies. The whole month, namely Adar, in which their condition had been changed from sorrow into gladness and from a time of distress to a holiday, 
was to be celebrated as a time for feasting and gladness and for sending presents, presents of food to their friends and to the poor. So the Jews accepted what Mordecai had written to them, how Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Macedonian, fought against them, how he made a decree and cast lots to destroy them, and how he went to the king, telling him to hang Mordecai. But the wicked plot he had devised against the Jews came back upon himself, and he and his sons were hanged. Therefore, these days were called Purim, because of the lots, for in their language, Pur is the word that means lots. And so, because of what was written in this letter, and because of what they had experienced in this affair, and what had befallen them, Mordecai established this festival, and the Jews took upon themselves, upon their descendants, and upon all who would join them, to observe it without fail. These days of Purim should be a memorial and kept from generation to generation in every city, family, and country. These days of Purim were to be observed for all time and the commemoration of them was never to cease among their descendants. The prayer spoken on Purim by Jewish people says, we thank you for the miraculous deliverance, for the heroism and for the triumphs of our ancestors from ancient days until our time. That could be a prayer for all of us on this All Saints Sunday. For Jewish people, Purim will be celebrated this coming February. You might say Purim is a little bit like Mardi Gras in the sense that it's related to a sacred story and it's festive and celebratory and sometimes goofy. Children dress up as the king and Mordecai and Queen Esther for costume parades at synagogues and Hebrew schools. And at some synagogues in more recent years, the adults perform in a musical parody called Purim Spiel. <laughs> now I can hear some of you saying, why are we talking about celebrating today? The world is a mess with wildfires and the pandemic. Two black men were killed this week by police, one of them 21, the other 27. The anxiety around the election is palpable, and we know the divisiveness that surrounds us won't go away after November 3rd. This doesn't seem like a time for joy. And yet, and yet, maybe it is for just such a time as this that we need to cultivate joy and celebration. The poet Maya Angelou offered us this wisdom. Laugh as often as possible, you must, because the world will offer you every reason to weep. So as often as possible, you laugh. That, I think, is part of the great love. So here's a question. What would you guess is the most popular class of all time at Yale University? the most popular class ever. It is Psych 157, Psychology and the Good Life, the Science of Well-Being. As it turns out, according to the science, the data, what we think will make us happy or content often doesn't. Maybe that doesn't surprise you all that much. But here's the thing. The data are able to tell us what does bring life satisfaction. What psychologists and sociologists have learned from modern research and data is what the author of the Book of Esther knew 2,500 years ago. Celebration is good for the soul, especially the art of savoring. Professor Lori Santos at Yale says savoring is the act of stepping outside of an experience to review and appreciate it. Often we fail to stay in the moment and really enjoy what it is that we're experiencing. 
Savoring intensifies and lengthens the positive emotions that come with doing or appreciating something you love. I savored the sight of the moon last night. I spent an extra minute there. It's related to gratitude, but it goes further. And savoring is a way of celebrating. What could be more sacred than savoring the gifts of God? A book I would commend to you is called The Book of Joy by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In it, they seek to answer the question, how do we find joy in the face of life's inevitable suffering? Now remember, both of these leaders have witnessed deep suffering in South Africa and Tibet. The Archbishop wrote this, discovering more joy does not, I'm sorry to say, save us from the inevitability of hardship and heartbreak. In fact, we may cry more easily, but we will laugh more easily too. Perhaps we are just more alive. He writes, yet as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We have hardship without becoming hard. We have heartbreak without being broken. More than just making us feel better, joy fuels us for the work we have to do. Sister Simone Campbell may be another name that you recognize. She has devoted her entire life to social justice. She is perhaps best known as an organizer of Nuns on the Bus. It was a series of cross-country bus tours to draw attention to issues around voting rights, poverty, and immigration issues. Sister Simone often speaks about the importance of joy, and she underscores how often it can be tempting for people who are focused on social justice and making change to sink into anger, frustration, and despair. It's understandable. But then she says, who wants to join a group that is angry and sad? We must cultivate joy and stay focused on our desired outcome. Joy provides fuel for hard work. It can be a magnet for others to join in the work. Joy is food for the worker's soul. When I remember Congressman John Lewis and his lifelong dedication to the cause of racial justice, I also think of the song by Pharrell Williams, Happy. John Lewis once said, this is my song. Nothing can bring me down. He would dance in his office. He would dance at campaign rallies. Every chance he got, this Lion of Congress would celebrate. We can all learn from him, especially today of all days, All Saints Sunday. You know, throughout his ministry, Jesus called out the injustices of the world, but he also said, I came that you might have life in all its abundance. All its abundance. God wants us to experience all of life, to see and know our interconnection, to be present to the moment, to ourselves, and to one another. Judaism has a raucous party every year to celebrate the Esther story. Even in a pandemic, perhaps especially in a pandemic, it helps to find things to celebrate. The sight of tiny trick-or-treaters, Wednesday, the gift of your pandemic pod, caramel apples, or the fact that we woke up and have another day to live fully. For such a time as this, practice gratitude, cultivate joy, savor the moments, celebrate as often as you can, laugh as often as possible. You must, because the world will offer you every reason to weep, so as often as possible, you laugh. That is part of the great love. We offer gratitude to Maya Angelou for those words of wisdom and a reminder that we all must look for the joy. Amen. Holy and loving God, 
We give thanks for all the ways we know and for the ways that we cannot even possibly understand that all the saints in our lives have affected and changed not only our lives, but the lives of all of our loved ones and the communities that they touch. So today on this All Saints Sunday, we lift up the saints in our lives and the life of this community who have died this past year. So for our th saints, we pray for Peggy Campbell, for Reverend Larry Craig, for Charles Davis, for Reverend Dr. H. E. Edwards, for Phyllis Gates, for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for Reverend Evan Golder, for Katie Hamilton, for John Hamilton, for Sarah Hankins, for Wilma Hanna, for Ann Hardy, for Ted Hardy, for Judy Horner, for Cecil Mellon, for Libby Muller, for Valerie Otani, for Philip Rainey, for Frederick Rick Reading, for Costella Robinson, for Roger Solomon, for Peggy Stevens, for Dr. Clarence Russell Thompson, for David Smith, for Paxton Van Swearingen, for the over 225,000 lives that have been lost in the U.S. to COVID-19. And for all the names of the saints that you can now lift up at your own homes and in your own places.
Now praying the prayer that all the saints who have gone before us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me thinking about uh, this meal, this sacrament, today on All Saints Sunday and today just a few days before the election, and how on this day that of course there is great angst and grief in our hearts, thinking about all the people we know personally and those that we do not know, that have died this past year. I'm just thinking about this upcoming election where there is truly angst and worry, perhaps fear and trepidation, maybe some hope that are swirling around in our hearts. It's at this meal when we are invited. It's at this meal where this food, this nourishment, this body and blood of Christ, that Christ is saying to us that all those pieces of you, all those feelings that you might think and it might feel like at times that it is overwhelming to your spirit, that you cannot handle anymore, that you cannot take anymore. And that is true at times. Yet it is at this table where Christ said all of those feelings, no matter what you are holding this day, that bring all those with you because you are welcome to eat at this table. And that you are filled and nourished and that you can have hope in this table in my body and in my presence. So friends, I hope that with all of who you are, And within the week to come, that you bring that to this table and you are fed here. So over our elements today, we say this prayer that we ask loving and holy God, may your spirit and grace and goodness, may they wash over these elements so they may be your body 
and blood your presence for us this day. Amen. Christ on the, Christ on the night that he was betrayed, he gathered with his friends and he sat down at the table and after the meal was finished, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat all of you. Whenever you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So ministering to us now in the name of Christ, we eat that same bread and we drink that same cup. So the bread of heaven broken for you. Amen. And the cup of salvation shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. God, in this week to come, with all that we might experience, We ask that what might sustain us and what might feed us is your presence and love. Amen. We have one announcement for you this morning. It's an important one for this season. Once again this year, Plymouth Church is putting together Thanksgiving dinner baskets for families of children in the Cleveland schools. And so we're asking for donations of any size. We want you to know that it takes $50 to put together one meal for one family. You can contribute through the online portal realm um, of the church, or you can send a check to the church. And once again, $50 provides one family with one Thanksgiving meal, which will be needed more than ever this year. So thank you in advance for your support. I suspect we are all kind of holding our breath as we head into the coming week. Doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. My prayer for all of us is that we will remember that we are people of faith, people who are called to love our neighbors, all of them, to love others as God loves us. In that spirit, let us pray. 
God of life, of hope, of voice, and justice, we give you thanks for the awesome responsibility called voting. We give you thanks for all those who help make elections possible, secure, and safe. We're thankful for freedom of expression, fact-checking, and people willing to undertake the grueling job of working for candidates and running for office. Even the ones we don't like, oh God. God of life, of hope, of voice, and of justice, bless us with courage, strength, good humor, and love so that we may continue to move through these times, open our eyes, and speak from our deepest foundations of compassion. Bless us, O God, as we vote. Bless this work of our hands. Bless our nation, all nations, and all of your creation. And so may God bless you and keep you. May God shine God's face upon you and bring you peace today and always. Amen.